Hello everyone. Um, we're just going to wait a few minutes um, for more people to join and then we will start moving. So hello everyone and welcome to the Feminist Leadership in Disarmament. Um, on today's webinar, we'll be focusing on grassroots activism and its role in providing feminist perspectives to disarmament. Um, a very big welcome to our amazing speakers um, who I will go on to introduce later. Um, this webinar is the fourth thematic webinar as part of our broader feminist um, leadership in disarmament project, which includes a webinar series along with research, opinion and blog posts, as well as a social media campaign. The project's objectives is to raise awareness on the achievements and contributions of women working in the field with a focus on women from the global south. We also aim to explore the challenges that women face as they enter and progress in the field of disarmament. For this webinar, we aim to develop an understanding of the paramount importance of female activism and feminist, partic feminist perspectives for ensuring sustainable peace in human disarmament. And therefore, we aim to provide a floor for female feminist activists and politicians from grassroots organizations to share their personal stories and experiences as members of armed groups and, in, and as leaders um, in frontline organizations in different countries. So an overview of Scrap Weapons and what we do at Scrap. So Scrap Weapons is a, is a campaign that suggests adopting legal international agreements as a basis for general and complete global disarmament. At Scrap Weapons, we are constantly developing research projects about disarmament, verification, emerging technologies, and of course, feminism in this sector. And we hope to mobilize um, governmental, non-governmental, economic, and expert forces in support of the same outcome. So briefly, my name is Vanessa. Um, I am a, an advocacy advisor at Scrap Weapons and along with my colleague today, Reem, we will be moderating this webinar. Before I hand over to Reem, um, that we have a particular feature today, which is that of translation. Um, and therefore, to be able to hear Reem, um, you would have to switch the translation button to Spanish. It states Spanish, but um, in reality, it's going to be a translation feature from Arabic. Yes, we can hear you.
Is somebody speaking or uh, just like, because uh, things are quiet? Vanessa, can you hear me? Vanessa, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Seems nice. Hello. Are you listening? I don't hear you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me?
So I believe we are still having some technical issues here. We still can't hear Sarah speak. Um, therefore, I would kindly pass the floor to Jacon to um, give her presentation. Thank you. Was I given a floor? Yes, you were, Sarah. Um, if, you, if you're available to speak, that would be great right now. Um, and then Jaconda can just go after you. Um, okay, let her go. It looked like she has started, but because um, I didn't hear anything, let her go ahead and then I will follow her. Sorry about that. Yes, please. Then Jaconda, please. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm very glad to be participating in this webinar from, for Scrap. Uh, what I can tell you is my experience was from a long time ago, I have to say that. Uh, I was involved in the Sandinista revolution in um, the 70s. It, this revolution triumphed in 1979. Uh, and a lot of us women were involved in many <clears throat> tasks in this revolution. The first thing I did was to be in the urban resistance. So we used to be able to work on keeping people safe, you know, people who were in safe houses, carrying them from here to there, carrying weapons. We had to keep our identity. Uh, I was like, we used to say a legal person that meant that I was not persecuted yet. And so I had a, a cover that allowed me to move around, to do things, that other people were not able to do. And so I was a good cover up for, uh, you know, keeping uh, the other members who were not, uh, who were clandestine, informed about things and carrying mail. At that time, we didn't have cell phones, we didn't have fax, we didn't have computers. And so it was a lot of work to create this line of communication between the clandestine resistance. So that we, we were a lot of women who were working to facilitate those things until we were spotted by the security police. And then we had to go in hiding or we had to go into exile. So in my case, I went into exile after I was spotted by the security police, they followed me like for two months constantly. And I wasn't sure what they were going to do. I wasn't sure if they were going to detain me, but they didn't detain me. I was able to uh, resist, you know, and um, it was horrible because I had two kids and I had to, I was always afraid that they would come in barging in the middle of the night to get me. But then I was able to once they caught the person who I was most were closer with, I had to leave the country and I left. Uh, I went to Mexico and I went then to Costa Rica. I had gotten some military training, so I got more military training uh, and I was uh, in charge of logistics operations in Costa Rica. Uh, I also had civilian responsibilities like be the liaison for uh, the support we got in Costa Rica from diplo diplomats from other countries, from the same Costa Rican government. And um, as I said before, I had two kids. So for me, it was quite complicated to be, uh, to have uh, two daughters plus doing all these things. Plus I had to work to, to, to make my living. So I worked during the day, then during the night, in Costa Rica, I would do all my clandestine affairs and uh, go talk to people. And I had a lot of logistics responsibilities. Like I had to bring, for example, all the weapons for one assault. Oh, oh and I did participate in an assault uh, when I was in Nicaragua. Uh, I was in charge of getting all the logistics again for this assault uh, and that was successful. It was a very successful assault where, you know, only one people died and it was a, 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 a guys took a house that where a lot of Somosistas were having a party. 
and uh, we asked for a lot of things for, to release the hostages and we asked for you know the liberation of all our comrades who were in jail and a plane and a million dollars and they finally had to uh, to uh, to agree to all of these things uh, and it was not it was a bloodless uh, commando action that was in 74 and then you know then in 78 the revolution triumphed in 79 we were able to create a very strong presence internationally and we were able to uh, also supply our troops with a lot of materials with a lot of weapons a lot of need, things that were needed because it was a very strong armed struggle Somoza had a you know a regular army and we were a guerrilla army so you know at some point we we had a place near Costa Rica where we did have a a kind of regular struggle regular with regular weapons uh, what is called a, a a war of positions not a war of not a guerrilla affair but inside the country there was a lot of guerrilla affairs going on and uh, the women mostly were in support roles. There were a lot of women fighting inside the country. The first, in fact, the first liberated city in Nicaragua during that the liberation war was liberated by five women. And the first city was a woman that was in charge of the, you know, of the taking of the city. So women had an important position in, uh, in, in, the, in the, you know, in the guerrilla, actions inside Nicaragua when we were at that war and then we had what was called the Contra War. We had the Contra War uh, which was this, the United States decided to that we were communists and dangerous in Nicaragua so they uh, armed uh, the Somoza uh, army that had been left from the struggle. They armed them and then, then we had a, a nine-year war and there, you know, uh, the Sandinistas, when they came to power, they decided that women should not be in the army. That was one of the things that us women got very mad about. But they said that it was very complicated to have women and men in the barracks and, and the logistics of having women and men together. And then, you know, so women were in administrative positions in the army. But uh, when we had this contra war, it was mostly men. Men were the ones who went out in the field. We had a, a military recruitment uh, that was uh, obligatory. And uh, I lost myself. Well, that was obligatory and then uh, it was very hard to experience war in these terms for me personally uh, with my kids uh, i had to you know i believe that uh, motherhood is not compatible with war and uh, like alberto moravia this uh, italian writer said motherhood is not compatible with the atomic bomb i think we are a uh, we have we are much better at disarmament i think we had an experience in nicaragua when uh, our first woman president violeta chamorro was the one who won the elections in 1990 against the sandinistas but she had a very important role in disarming uh, what was left of the contrast and of that war that we had for many years that was very painful it, it cost us like 30,000 people were killed uh, in that war. And so we have had this uh, process of disarmament and uh, trying to put into place uh, the ethic of caring for women. That is my personal position. I think we women have a very important role to play in disarmament, in trying to stop all these wars in trying to create forms of dialogue and conciliation. I think women in that regard, we have a very 
a, a, an experience that is very valuable for uh, for I'm sorry I'm having trouble with this well our experience is very valuable and I think uh, I'm glad I am able to come here and tell you about this it's because we are again having a problem with now this uh, the guy who was the head of the Sandinistas has become a tyrant he be he came back to power and now we are having another kind of war not a war precisely but a very repressive regime and but not, this time we have decided to be pacifists and not get involved in another war we have had suffered so much from one war after another so and i think women are playing an important part in keeping this uh, civic outlook going thank you Thank you so much for, for that presentation, Jaconda. I particularly loved the emphasis you made on how a feminist perspective or um, a, a, a view, a view um, brought about by, by a feminist um, lens emphasizes the humanization of the disarmament process and emphasizes how important um, the civil society is in, in the process. So thank you so much for that. Um, I will now go on to introduce our next speaker, um, who is Sarah. Um, so Sarah uh, was born yep. in the, yes, I'm just going to briefly introduce um, you first and then I'll leave the floor to you, Sarah. Um, so Sarah was born in an Itang refugee camp in Ethiopia in 1970. Um, she is a mother and a grandmother as well. Sarah joined the armed group in the Sudan's People Liberation Movement and Army in 1988, and she was a nurse um, after returning from training in Cuba. And she served in the Bright Star campaign and, and was a leader for female soldiers in the SBLMA. Sarah worked in health centers for refugees in Ethiopia and Kenya, and she founded and is the current director of the Gender Empowerment for South Sudan organization. Sarah is also a former MP in the Upper Nile States Legislative Assembly and later as Minister of Social Development in the Upper Nile States. She was also a delegate in the High Level Revitalization Forum for the IGAD um, led mediation on South Sudan. Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Rim, um, and uh, greetings to all South America, the Arab world, Europe, and Africa those that are listening. I'm happy to be here in uh, Scrap Weapons event today. Um, I am pleased to, to be with you guys. Um, yeah, I don't know. Are you able to see me? See, si. yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, my story is, um, as Rim has already, uh, Vanessa has already introduced you um, to to me, uh, who I was, I think there is really little to even add. Uh, my genesis, as you hear, uh, I was born to a family of liberators, mom and dad together. That is why I ended up being born in Ethiopia refugee camp, Itang. And uh, the family, um, I think their background are these people who believe in liberty. You know, you are born liberal and you have to maintain that. Uh, they don't believe in oppression and segregation and marginalization. So I think with this, um, one uh, was socialized in that kind of environment. So I became a very tender age as a, a child soldier. Uh, I was in Big Farm, uh, which was then the headquarter of the People Liberation Army, People Liberation Movement in 1985. Uh, at that time, I was under age for sure. And we were trained, basic trainings, and then on we benefited in the um, uh, to be in Cuba. So I went to Cuba and um, uh, from Cuba, I gained to be trained as an auxiliary nurse. And because of curiosity and desire of continuing, um, uh, are people getting me? Are we together? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. Then um, I, I, I did auxiliary nursing, which I felt that at my tender age, if I come back to the movement, 
uh, I would um, contribute. Um, I will contribute to, to 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 my people, you know, in the struggle. So we came and we ended up now in the military headquarter, a training headquarter, where uh, I a feather went through training in 1988. Now I list to be a proper soldier, but at the same time serving the the forces and uh, the new recruits under training, which was then in the father, um, in the SAR and so on and so forth. Um, after that, um, Ethiopian uh, government uh, drug as uh, when it, um, you know, after Cold War, most of the communist and socialist countries in Africa lost together with Russia. And so Ethiopian government also, which was then a strong supporter of um, SPLA, SPLM, uh, had to lose. And this uh, force, um, forced us out of Ethiopia. But even before that, I was assigned to Brighter Star campaign and mostly on um, in, in the headquarter where uh, the miners, the Red Army, the, the, the younger, the young one uh, are being trained in a place called Dima. So I went there. Uh, with my uh, with my um, skill uh, to go and serve uh, them as a medical cop, so went there and uh, one tried to 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 even acquire further studies because of course I had to do auxiliary nursing so that I can contribute to the struggle. So I felt they should be needed, but that did not um, did not get enough chance. So we ended up in South Sudan soil. Uh, where we went through a lot of challenges, you know, um, the government of Sudan was uh, pursuing us. Uh, the current government of Ethiopia, which was then Oyale, was also pursuing us. So we become criminal in two in two countries. It wasn't that easy. Young age, a girl in um, in service. It was never a easy because I was still a girl. Um, I was separated from my parents. So. Um, they are in a place called Pakok. Um, uh, a clinic was set. We have very limited resources, and we had a lot of cases of sickness, of incident, of you know all those, and we had to deal with them one way or the other. Um, I remember when uh, AICF, uh, a French, uh, a French organization, had to come in, and I think this is when I understood the importance of. Um, this uh, international relief and humanitarian response agencies. They really came at the right time. The, the ICRC uh, also came in and we were forced to clear a strip. You know, we didn't have tools, but we have to use all that we have uh, to survive. And I remember a, a great biscuit, which they call a BB-5, save a lot of lives, trust me. Um, so, uh, from there, we move on later on because the government was recapturing places that we captured earlier. Uh, we were dealing also at this time uh, with the rip within the movement, and and this became the worst of all. You know, the internal rip now added even to already suffering uh, population, uh, and particularly the young ones. Uh, furthermore, uh, you know, furthering the, the suffering, but we have to deal with it. Now, um, my, 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 my experience while we were in, I'm, I'm taking us a little bit back, uh, as, as in, in the training, one of the, the things that I remember uh, as challenge really that one went through is that uh, we were trained hard. There was nothing like you are young, no. You have to go through whatever an adult goes. The only difference would be, you know, when, when, when we are practicing uh, operating and shooting of, of of guns is where you will um, you will have a, a, a different because you know there are those weapons that are uh, requiring certain weight and capacity and strength physical strength for you to shoot but otherwise any other any other weapon that uh, fit with your age and and your body size and muscles we were but any other training trust me we have gone through it all. We went through it all, um, yeah. um, and and this one find it a little bit hard because there was no consideration with the age factor. 
uh, it's not a bad, a bad girl, but rather each. We, we felt that there would have been consideration about it, you know, the certain thing you have to know, this person body-wise as, uh, you know, uh, um, anatomy-wise has not yet, you know, fully grown to that, um, to that level of, of kind of training, but we went through. Um, the other thing is that the, always for us who are younger, we tend to be abused in, in so many ways. Uh, we went through a lot of physical abuse. You are caned for nothing. You are, you know, we went through all that and um, which was not even part of training, but it looked like some, when I was young, I used to see them like the cowards who can't talk to their fellow men. They come and resort into <laughs> abusing us, the weak one. Um, they want to come and show how much it would be. Um, the other thing is that, um, which I felt was not right, is that we were never given any leadership empowerment. You know, like you are given a skill so that you become a decision maker. You can analyze, you know, analytical capacity where as, as people who need to survive, um, we, were, we were denied those, we were denied those. And it was like as if there was a program to hold you hostage of your ignorance of certain things. And it was done by design. Uh, it was done by design. So what they they they, they feed you much, uh, feed you with, you know, the hatred of the current regime. You are fed. You are fed of. You can kill them. You know, there is no compromise and all that. You are being brainwashed basically. And good thing is that because one has been in Cuba, that sometimes you would be like, uh, you know, little education we got gain in Cuba would cause you to reason a little bit. Like, wow, should this be like that? shouldn't be any different, you know, if I'm being trained to be a, a, a capable, you know, soldier, there should be maybe an element that should be added or a, uh, an element that should not have been included because this become like, we are just being more into this kind of pathetic kind of soldiers, which to me, you know, I remember there is this song, a great song that is well known in the SPLA that even your own father you can kill. So the question would be, if, if your father or your mother you can kill, then whom, whom are you liberating, you know? Liberating. This, this is a question I always ask myself. If I'm, I'm being told to kill my own, then who is this that the liberation is standing for? A question even up to today, I have not gotten an answer to it. Um, so, um, in, in those training, there was nothing like um, uh, a consideration that God has created us differently. There was nothing like that. The only difference is that girls, they have their, their, their rooms or rather their compound or their dormitories and, and boys. But beside that, there is nothing like when we talk about, um, you know, the necessities that God made us to be women. There was nothing like that, you know. And we know that um, the movement has a way to survive here and there, but because the, in, in the missions where the movement is selling it ideas and acquiring um, resources, it never consider that within our forces, we have got female, we should have a special consideration, not because of anything special, but because the way God has made them to be women, it, it was lacking, it was zero percent. And this, um, subjected some of us into, you know, like you are there and you are constantly being reminded of being a woman, especially when you are having that special time in, in the month, you know, special that, time, that special time in the month where you may need to be considered that you are not that so well because others come with crumb um, or others come heavy and they needed, you know, not to be humiliated in the forces, especially when there is activities to be done. There was nothing like that. There was absolutely 100% nothing like that. And so we were also facing some psychological torture within, um, within the forces, you know, um, as female uh, soldiers. Um, the other thing is that um, there was also no capacity building much in upgrading the girls. Like um, giving ranks, girls are the least. We are being trained and, and the worst part, especially when they see you like, you should be there as a cook, you know? You go through this other training, but you are good 
to do the cooking aspect of things. You know, you are being reminded, by the way, even if you, are, you could be an officer, still your place should be where women are. But when tough other things are being done, you are not being given those considerations. So there was an element of abuse. There was an element of abuse. Now, coming to um, uh, women perspective uh, in the army, uh, much of it was the negative part, not the positive part that women would have added value, you know, their level of intelligence, um, their talents that could be promoted. It has never, I haven't seen it in our forces during the liberation. Um, neither was our contribution promoted to be let know that yes, even the marginalized of the marginalized are women and our SPLA agenda is also to see to it that the world should be aware within our forces we have got women and if there is any knowledge that extra knowledge that others have this experience could be adapted to improve our female cadres and in, in the movement there was nothing like that so our agenda was not being sold we only have to benefit maybe alongside the red army because we were red army so when the word go out as Red Army, then you identify because of a Red Army, but there was nothing special about you as a woman because of how God created you. Now, um, when it comes to disarmament, by the time we are coming to get out, it's mostly uh, like for me, it is through marriage. And this is what also I saw um, from most of my female um, comrades. We all uh, left later on because of marriage. Uh, you are married and then you ended up being a mother, of course, and that, you know, like my, my sister, my previous speaker mentioned, it. you have no any other way, but there is nothing like, okay, this is a time you can be given, um, you know, like a program or a strategy to say when our female cadres has to be, you know, when it reaches a, a, strategy, a strategy for them now to transit from being, um, active soldiers or officers or cadres to when they become families. And, and if they have to continue, for example, how do they need to continue? There was nothing like that. So it would be you to use your natural, uh, natural um, uh, instinct to see whether it is right time for you to move on. Otherwise, you can always be just there and they will take pleasure in, um, yeah. in doing whatever. And the saddest thing was like, we didn't have a female soldier. I mean, a, a female officer. In all the, 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 my assignment, I never come across um, a female officer that would be my line leader. I never seen that. I've always been under um, the, the, the male counterpart leaders who do as they wish. And I'm always the, the you know, the subordinate or the, the, the junior to be dealt with, uh, with in the highest way possible. Um, yeah, thank you so much for that, Sarah. I, I really, really do love the emphasis that you just made on the last part on the importance of having female mentors for, for young girls who, who are um, engaged in this armament. I really loved the emphasis you made on the importance of um, leadership training, of, of mentoring. And in that respect, we actually have a webinar um, on the 28th of April that will be focused solely on um, that topic, therefore, uh, we'll provide the link so that if anyone is interested in furthering the topic, they can um, register and learn more about how training and mentorship programs work for um, female young women who are engaged in this armament. Um, at this point, I would love to, to pass the floor to our third speaker, who is Nayat. Um, Nat is currently a PhD student in psychology and social issues facing the three refugees in the UK. She has the National Women Movement in Sudan um, and she is a co-founder of Women for Peace and Security in Sudan and also a member in the Coordination Committee of Sudanese Women in Civic and Political Groups. Nayat joined the armed group, the Sudan's People Liberation Movement or ARMY in 2002 and she is the deputy head of the movement's office in Khartoum State. 
Nayat also negotiated on the movement's behalf in the GDA platform and was responsible for the IDPS and the refugee file for the party during the negotiations. The floor is yours, Nayat. Thank you. Um, sorry, everyone, due to logistical issues, I'm going. Uh, Nadia will be speaking, and then I'll be translating after her because we just couldn't make the simultaneous translation work. We apologize for that again. Assalamu alaikum, jamiaan. كيف عاملين والنساء المناضلات والأخ المناضل معنا وكيف الحال؟ أنا طبعاً نجاة سليمان مصطفى البكر من منطقة من شمال دارفور. من حتى اسمها أمبرو مع في الشمال شمال يعني حدود ال ال الشرقية للتشاهد يعني ممكن في أربعة خمسة ساعات بندخل تشاهد والقبائل المشتركة يعني أنا تجرب كي طبعا دار أحكي لكم أول حاجة معانا أختنا اسمها سارة يا ربي من جنوب السودان ممكن ترجمة ده أيوة Okay, um, she just wants to, she just said um, hello to everyone and she's very pleased to be here with her fellow uh, comrades. And um, her, this is Nadia, she is from North Darfur. North, she is from, um, um, like her village is uh, Umbaru, which is very close to the border between Sudan and Chad. And um, she is going to now talk about her experience. أنا بس دار أول حاجة أبدأ بالاعتذار لأختنا سارة من جنوب السودان أنا والله من ما وكنت أنا صغيرة يعني في المتوسط ودائما بسمع بأن في حرب في جنوب السودان يعني ولو كده كان في دارفور يعني إحنا بتركيب الجيش السوداني الجنود مننا نحن يعني ونحن المشينا قاتلنا ال 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 الحركة الشعبية في جنوب السودان تسعين في المية من الجنود المشاركين كانوا من أبناء دارفور وإحنا نعتزل في الحتة دي وأنا أقدر أذكركم برضو إن ده أخوي طبيب الأصغر من برضو يستشهد في الحتة دي مع الحكومة ترينغاز عم ولهم يعني غسيل دماغ أنا كان الوحيد المؤترد من الأسرة إنه الحرب دي ما حرب حقيقية ودي حرب تجارة باسم الدين لكن يعني قدر الله ما شاء فعل يعني. She just wanted to apologize to Sarah because, um, um, uh, like, basically, the war on uh, South Sudan, um, most of uh, the soldiers in the Sudanese army hailed from Darfur. So she, she knew about the war from a very young age when she was in school and she heard about it. And one of her brothers um, uh, died in the war, actually, because uh, she feels that he was brainwashed. So she said that, I mean, from the very beginning, she was against uh, what was going on in uh, South Sudan, the war on South Sudan, and that was being done in the name of religion. وعندهم أهداف وإسرائيل داخلة معاه ما بعرف أمريكا حياة زي ده إحنا نهم في برين ووشن في الحتة دي يعني وأما عن دارفور إحنا عندنا كمية من الحركات أحمدت نحت دارفور في اللحيب الأحمر ده من زمن الإنجليز في ثورات كثيرة قامت والسوين في نيالا وبول داود يحيى بولاد برضو كان جمع من الحركة الشعبية برضو قتل في جبل مرة دي كلها الثورات اللي كانت يعني أحمدت لكن نفس السو... نفس ال... الثورات دي ونفس الأشخاص دي بمرور الزمن يعني فعلا هي أحمدت لكن الفكرة زي ما قالوا مبتمود والفكرة حية فكرة الثورة حية وفي شباب تجمعوا قبل قبل 2002 يعني تجمعوا والشباب دي يعني كانوا في بدوا بالضبط ال 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 الحرق حركتين يعني قام بصفة رسمية الحركة الأولى اللي هي قامت بمؤتمر من ألمانيا اللي هو حركة العدل المساواة المنشق من هنا يعني من من النظام وحركة تحرير السودان طبعا هم مجموعة من الشباب ال 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 بسموهم الأحرار دير يعني قاموا بالفكرة دي وكان في جزء منهم في جبل مرة كانوا بقيادة عبد الواحد نور وفي جزء منهم في كرنوي أو أب قمرة بالتحديد بقيادة من ناوي عنده مجموعة المجموعة دي تكونت من 19 ما كان حتى من ناوي معهم في البداية يعني المجموعة دي تكونت يعني من ظلم اللي بيحصل لهم وكان في يعني لو طلعوا يعني بيقتلوهم باسم النهب المسلح 
Um, so um, Darfur has always been marginalized uh, since you know Sudan's independence, and um, they were always kind of told to be quiet and not to show any kind of resistance. And uh, different conflicts were kind of raged against them in the name of religion. And um, she said that for a long time people were brainwashed, and uh, some began organizing, and they began organizing kind of in a revolutionary way. But unfortunately, um, they were killed off as individuals or as groups uh, by the government. So, um, but she said that ideas don't die. And at the end of the day, the ideas kept moving forward until um, so two main uh, armed groups were established um, in 2002. One is called Justice and Equality Movement, uh, led by um, uh, you know, uh, some like professionals and another movement led by young men called um, Sudan Liberation Army and Movement. And it was led by um, different commanders. The two, uh, the two prominent ones are Minni Minnawi and Abdul Wahid Noor. أنا الحركتين دول في 2002 من الحركة دي بدت أنا كنت في السعودية يعني في أول شهر كنت أنا في 2000 شهر ثلاثة مع بداية الحركة أنا كنت في شهر. أول إعلان كانوا أعلنوه عن قيام الحركة في منطقة جولو أنا لحظتها في السعودية وطوالي علمت إني أنا هنضم مع دير والله صراحة من غير ما يتلو إنه يكونوا أحداكم شنو لكن عرفت إنه دير مهمشين ودير من منطقتي يعني ناس أصلاً وكلنا بنعاني من نفس التهميش وأنا صراحة يعني مع النظام النظام الإنغاس ما يعني ما حمل الدين أي حاجة بس كان نظام مبني على إنك تأيده وعلى على على التأييد الغبلي أكثر شيء وعشان إنك ترجع مكانة لازم أنت يعني تأيده وتعمل الحاجات اللي هم عايزينهم بس أنت ما عندك أي غرار يعني وما حتى ما ما بيسمعوا لأي زول جاته إلا زول يكون معاه حتى بعد ذاك يكون عشان كده أول ما الحركة دعوا لنا طوالي أنا انضميت ليهم بالرغم إنه أنا كان زوجي برضو قال لي أنت ما تدمي معنا سا دكتور جبريل خليل الله هاي الوقت ذاك كان هو في هولندا قال لي أنت ما تنضمي ليهم أقرب ليك قلت لهم تاني أنا ما تقولوا لي أقرب ليك ولا ما أقرب ليك أنا بنضم بدير ما قال لي ديل ناس محررين قلت لهم بس أنا مع المحررين ديل لأنه الحركة الإسلامية نموذج نموذج غير يعني رشيد وحكم غير عادي يعني ما بنضم ليهم. In 2002 uh, she was in Saudi Arabia working at the time there and then when she she heard about the movement being established, GEM and SLA, uh, she decided even without knowing um, their vision or their objective, she decided that if this is a movement that is going to fight for the marginalized people in Darfur, she's going to join. And she announced that she's going to join the SLA. And she said even her husband at the time told her that you should join GEM, but because she was so frustrated at the government, which, is, which was Islamist, and GEM was considered uh, an Islamist movement, she decided to join the more progressive SLA um, uh, and um, uh, Sudan Liberation Army and Movement, and um, this is how she became a member of SLAM. أنا طبعا انضمامي كان انضميت أنا كسياسية لكن لما انضميت كسياسية أنا بحثت على ال 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 على مكتب في السعودية هم منهم وكانوا الموجودين من وزارة الأوقاف ذاك ونش وأنشطتهم كيف وعرفت إنه عندهم أنشطة وفي ناس شغالين أنا يعني دوري كان شنو يعني ما عندي كان وظيفة واضحة بكل أسف يعني ما يعني بتكلم عن الحركة وبمشي اجتماعات الحركة وما في مكتب للمرأة في السعودية لكن أنا منضمة والشغل اللي أنا قاعدة أشتغله حتى الرجال يمكن ما ما يكونوا قاعدين يقولوا أنا بشتغل مثلاً في التلفون طلع زوجي كده للشغل أنا بقعد بس للتلفون ما أعمل حاجاتي سريع ما كنت شغالة في السعودية بس في التلفون السابق ده وبنشر إنه في حركة وينضموا معاه بجي بشحن تلفوني بضرب مثلاً بضرب للأهل هناك في البلد بإنه أنا مثلاً منطقتي هم ناس إدارة أهلية ضد الحاجات دي الإدارة الأهلية هي سي والإدارة الأهلية كانت يعني مائلة لل للمؤتمر الوطني أنا يعني طالع من من أسرة الإدارة الأهلية لكن يعني خديت لأسرتي ولكل الناس اللي أنا بعرفهم وبحكم يعني وجودي عندهم ويعني مع يعني هم بعزون شديد يعني وعلى حسب موقعنا في الأسرة برضو بتلم أنتوا يعني حتى لو ما دايرين يعني تدخلوا مع الناس ديل ما تعادوهم الناس ذل ما حيضروكم انتو الناس ذل عندهم مطالب من الحكومة وما حيضر زول قاعد هنا وانتو بس اخلوهم يعني انتو ما تشتغلوا ضدهم ما تشتغلوا مخابرات حتى يعني في جزء كبير جدا من الشباب اللي انضموا كان بفضل عنه يعني حتى الرجال انضموا بفضل عنه 
she said that um, at the time, so she, she began finding the members who are in, uh, the members from the uh, movement who are in Saudi Arabia, she would meet, she would go to meetings. And then at the time when, uh, she, when she became like unemployed and not working, the minute, like she would wake up in the morning, she would start making phone calls, recruiting people to the movement, calling people in Sudan, in Saudi Arabia, in different places, uh, attracting them to the, to the movement. And uh, she would even call people in her village. And she said that at the time, the, one of the problems that she was facing is that her family, she comes from a family who are um, part of the native administration or the tribal administration in her area. And she had to speak to them and tell them, do not stand uh, against this, uh, this armed movement. You have to, even if you don't want to support them, do not uh, uh, stand against them and make sure that, um, that uh, you don't share their news. And she said that at the time, she was able to recruit a lot of people into the movement and especially uh, young people. في في 2004 في النهايه رجحت السودان ولسه كان الحركه لسه ما وقعت اتفاقيه السلام بعد ما انا رجحت في 2005 2006 تم التوقيع لكن قبل الكلام ده كله لما رجحت هنا بالداخل برضه يعني يا داب الامور بقت سهله وبقيت اتصل من هنا مباشره يعني حتى انا بعرف كثيرين جدا من الميدان يعني بديهم اي معلومه هم عايزينه لحد الوقت ده انا ما عندي اي صله في الحركه، لكن بساعد بكل ما عندي، يعني مثلا يعني في المعسكرات حتى اهلنا يعني ناس منطقتنا بالذات يعني ضد الحاجه دي، هم بينتموا الإدارة الاهليه اللي انا طالعه منها، كانوا ضد الفكره وهم في تشاد، برضه بنرسل لهم رسائل كثيره جدا انه انتم يا جماعه ابو خلوكم مع الناس زين. في الاخر اتحيدوا بيقوا خلاص عرفوا انه صح الدوله دي هي ظالمام وديل ناس حقيقيين وكده حركه تحرق السودان كان يعني كل الناس انضمت ليها يعني في 2004 2005 كل الشباب من الجامعات اشتغلنا هنا بعد ما جيت لو في اي تجمع طلابي انا بمشي بمشي يعني بخاطبهم وبكلمهم وبنورهم انه اهميه الانضمام للحركه وكده يعني للوقت ذاك انا اصلا ما عندي اي صفه بس انا انضميت وكده ما في زول قاعد يسال انك انت تعملي كده ليه ليه انت كده يعني أنا بس يعني مت... يعني مش طوعي يعني خلاص يعني ما ولا قاعد أسأل من الهيكلة هي شنو والزول يبقى شنو ما قاعد أسأل من الحاجات دي لكن أنا داير الحركة دي تنجح وما شايفة إنه في حاجات منفصلة للنساء أصلا ما في وجود لكن النساء في الميدان يعني إحنا عندنا حتى النساء بحكم العرف النساء حتى في المعسكرات حتى لو معارضات للحركة دي حتى لو من أي حتة ما عندهم مشكلة يعني شوف النساء في المعسكرات بيجمعوا الاكل والشراب يعني مثلا الحطب يعني في نساء بيشيلوا الحطب في راسهم مع السلاح بخط السلاح في النص وبيشيلوا الحطب ده في راسهم بيطلعوا بالجبل يعني هم مش الحطب وجا لكن الوسط ده كله سلاح بيطلعوا بالجبل فوق للجيش في جزء منهم بيجمعوا في الاكل في الشراب في العيش في الفحم في الحاجات في اي حاجه هم بيجمعوا من قروشهم الغريبة إنه نفس النساء ممكن يجمعوا لحركة العدل والمساواة وممكن يجمعوا لحركة تحرير السودان بس ما دايرين أولادهم ديل جوعوا ما دايرين يعني وقت ما ديل جوعوا يعني في شكل معسكرات مثلا في الميدان هم بكون في جنب جنب المعسكرات بكون في معسكرات للمت... للحركة الفتاح المسلح هم بيحاولوا بيدعموا أي طرف ما بقولوا ده عدل ومساواة ما بقولوا ده حركة تحرير السودان بس النساء يعني بس كان دورهم بس دعم 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 so 2005 she came back to Sudan uh, uh, with her family and then she started working uh, for the favor of uh, of the movement so so basically she started ad advocating with her family and with her relatives who at the time were in the IDP camps internally displaced people's camps in Chad and then she started working with university students so every time she would hear about any gathering for students uh, from the four at the at the different universities she would go and she would speak to them and she would start recruiting them uh, to join the movement so she said 2004 2005 many youth people joined uh, many youth joined the movement because they really believed that it is the way forward for them and it is going to bring change to their four so she said that, um, and this was her role, and at the time she didn't have a title in the movement, but she just really believed in it uh, and its vision, and she wanted it to succeed. She wanted it to achieve its goals. Um, she said that women uh, uh, were very instrumental in the success of the movement. So uh, women in the field, in different places in the fort, they did a lot of logistics. 
women would uh, take food uh, to the um, uh, to the movement to the army basically component of the movement they would take any food that they could afford any food that they could gather uh, taking even sometimes using their own personal resources to support uh, the movement and they would also take uh, they would transport the the guns uh, to the movement so they would take uh, they would get bring wood and they would hide the guns inside the wood and then they would carry it on their head pretending that they're going to, coll to, to collect wood or that they are returning from collection of wood. And they would go up the mountain to the movement, uh, to their camps and give um, and, and, and transport the weapons and so on. So this is uh, the instrumental uh, role that women would play. And um, there's so many other roles that she wants to talk about. IT. <laughs> وكان السرية ممنوع إن زول يحمي السرية يمشي ودي لزول هنا يعني يصين ولا كده في بنات شغالات صيانة وهم اللي بيمشوا الميدان بيجيبوا الموبايلات دي بصينوها ما عارف شنو يعني مثلا نقول لك احنا ماشيين نشتغل خضار برا بالكارو يمشوا الاسواق الخارجية يجي يلاقوا واحد من ال من ال المسلحين ديل يقوم يديه ويجمع له الموبايلات السريات اللي هي دايرة صيانة بنفس الصورة بس هنا بعدين يعني هي بكون وردة خضار لكن ما باعته دبتقتي يعني تقول مثلا الخضار ده ما يتباع لكن بتدخل فيه السريات جوا وتجي راجع بيه مثلا المدن الكبيرة عشان يصينوا السرية <تصفيق> So like, and there were a lot of young women who studied IT and had knowledge in like, you know, IT and computer science. So they would pretend that they are selling vegetable. So they would ride their donkeys and take with them a lot of vegetables and go to the market pretending that they are, you know, vegetable sellers. But then they would meet, uh, you know, men from the movement in the market and they would give them Soraya phones and then they would hide it in their vegetables and then they would come back and, and fix the Soraya phones and return them in the same way. So they would do different trolls just so, Um, uh, just as a cover basically and to make sure that they don't get exposed <laughs> Yes. So and she said that um, uh, women were uh, basically uh, like the security wing of the movement. So they were the ones that they would, uh, you know, um, uh, watch the government, watch the army, what they're doing and uh, what is happening in the city, analyze the contents. And then they would uh, basically rely this information to the movement to make sure that they are giving them security and intelligence information that they could use to make their uh, like to basically to protect themselves. في 2005 في 2006 تم توقع الاتفاق اتفاق ابوجا وكل الرفاق جاب الداخل وفي اللحظه دي برضه ما في في مكتب للمراه يعني بس في 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 اثنين من النساء واحده في الهيكل فوق احنا نظام هيكلتنا انه في مساعد الرئيس في واحده في الشؤون الاجتماعيه والثانيه رئيسه بتاع مكتب الخرطوم هم بس كانوا اهتمامهم فقط بالمرتين دين يعني وبكل أسف حتى الاثنين دين يعني كان ظهورهم متأخر جدا ومن هنا من الخرطوم ظهروا فجأة كده يعني بدون أي في واحدة ظهرت في الجولة السابعة اللي هو تم في الجولة السادسة انضمت للحركة في الجولة السابعة وقعوا جمع الجماعة هي انضمت هناك في واحدة برضو المهم بس ظاهرة هي دكتورة طبعا وأول ما جاءت انضمت أدوها مكتب الخرطوم لكن كل النساء بالآلاف الجو الشغالين وفي ناس أولاد في الحركة والناس الدعم الحركات هناك في دارفور وجوا نازه المدن هنا كانوا بس يعني عدد عدد وكلنا عدد So, um, and this, uh, so in 2006, there was a peace agreement that was signed between the movement and between the government. And the movement was able to come to Khartoum, especially its leaders. But then this is when she saw that women were excluded. So there were only two women in the leadership of the, of the movement, only two of two of them. And one of them appeared in the during the negotiations, uh, uh, during the negotiation round, the sixth round of the negotiations that actually led to the to the signing of the peace agreement. So women uh, became once again the thousands of women who were supporting and who were working with the movement and who were supporting them in the field during the, the past few years became kind of an accessory, an afterthought, you know, and they were excluded again from the different 
different leadership uh, you know, structures um, of the movement after the peace agreement were signed, was signed. Um, okay, we will stop here to give Shireen a chance to talk and we will return later if there are any questions. Come on, Shireen. Yalla. So much for that, Ari. Um, and thank you, Najat, so much for your for your contribution. I very much appreciated once again the emphasis that you made on these structures that are um, designed for men and by men, which don't really give a space to women to actually um, thrive in, and therefore they need to to, to be changed. Um, I would now pass the mic on to Shireen, but before that, I would love to to introduce um, our final speaker for today. So Shireen is the Global Partnership for the Prevention of Armed Conflict um, and the Meet. She, she is um, the MENA Region Liaison Officer, apologies, for the Global Partnership for the Prevention of Armed Conflict. Um, Shireen also volunteers as executive member of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom um, in the Lebanon section. And since 2003, she has been a Stop Killer Robots campaign team leader in Lebanon. And um, as mentioned before, um, she is a regional gender focal point for various international boards. I uh, would love to pass the mic on to you, Shri. Now the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vanessa. I was enjoying every second of the talk of the previous speakers. Thank you so much, uh, Najat, Sarah, and Jaganda, for the wonderful experiences that you have lived, and which makes my work so relevant to say that I will work. Uh, and I feel that my work is something that your children will not have to live what you have lived. What I do mainly is I do grassroots activism so that we can push forward uh, the agendas of uh, uh, UN Security Council Resolution 1325 in terms of the Women, Peace and Security and the, the ATT and the POA uh, Plan of Action. But, let me start uh, with uh, with my presentation. I was really like just flowing with uh, with the presentations. Thank you so much. Let me go back now to Mena uh, to talk about uh, some of the root causes of conflict in the Mena region, include the ongoing militarization of societies, reprisals against peace builders and women peace builders and activists social and gender inequalities, high number of refugees and IDPs, high rates of unemployment, poverty, and illiteracy, even before the consequences of COVID-19, and patriarchal stereotypes, missed opportunities of development throughout a long history along the MDGs and the SDGs. This is a background that we need to know about uh, the MENA and uh, the Arab world that, we, that I'm going to focus on. The Arab world presents only 5% of the world population. At the same time, the region receives 36% of the world's arms trade. Five of the top 10 arms importing countries also belong to this region. We know that small arms light weapon are further used to facilitate sexual and gender-based violence, increased number of child soldiers, as we heard now, Sarah, and reinforces violent, gender, patriarchal, masculine, social norms. So what if, if all these factors are not, do not have regulated, they do not have regulations of any meaningfully implemented laws by absence of national mechanisms and regional mechanisms. This is also a question that we need to see uh, within uh, the Arab region. I will divide my talk into two parts. The first part, I will cover my work within uh, WOLF, uh, a project that we're work working on. And the second part will be uh, on the work that I do with GPAC. Uh, within the work that I've done with the uh, Wolf uh, Lebanon section, we had a, a small project uh, last year in uh, 2020 to talk about uh, the misuse uh, and use of uh, light weapon, small arms and light weapon and the GBV. Uh, the project was as a, a result of certain recommendations of a, a UPR uh, uh, on Lebanon that we also submitted with the uh, World Secretariat. 
Uh, Lebanon uh, definitely has uh, many issues that we can cover. First, if we look at uh, uh, now, uh, also Najat was talking about the war at the end of war, the peace processes, uh, DDR, and the role of women and uh, was and like what what happens after World War in Lebanon. We did not have a DDR. We did not have a transitional justice, and hence issues are very much complicated. Between 2007 and 2007, we had almost 750,000 small arms light weapon. In 2017, we had 1,927,000 uh, small arms light weapon, while we had only 30,000 license in general. One uh, well, 135 of which were allocated to women. So just with this picture, we can see what kind of gender imbalance we have, what kind even of violations to uh, uh, the national laws uh, of Lebanon, where the weapons and ammunition law uh, does not uh, approve of uh, uh, acquisition of arms outside the military uh, uh, security official forces. Uh, second uh, thing, uh, Lebanon became a state party of the ATT in 2019. Lebanon had its first national action plan on 1325 also in 2019. Uh, Lebanon was passing through a revolution, a revolution in 2019 where it set the issues of uh, state building and definitely uh, issues of arms, issues of equality, issues of state building and the rule of law. So these were all factors that led us to do this uh, study. The study had uh, uh, objectives in terms of how much women are aware of the national laws, how much they're aware of the international laws, and uh, how uh, uh, we wanted to know how did the NGOs who work on GBV uh, do trainings or capacity building to their staff or two women to be able to report uh, cases and violations of usages and misusages of small arms and light weapon. Uh, one, one more point is that the, the Lebanese the National Action Plan uh, had uh, at its uh, second strategic priority, the issue of small arms light weapon in terms of its uh, prevention lens. Uh, I think uh, the Lebanese uh, National Action Plan is one of uh, the best national action plans in terms of uh, prevention lens. This is not to talk about implementation, I'm talking in general about the NAP itself. So during the uh, implementation of the project, we had uh, many challenges, definitely COVID was a challenge. Uh, 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 and one of the most important challenges was the Lebanon explosion that you were all uh, most probably aware of. Uh, this explosion by itself uh, is something we need also to, to see, like how come a 34.7 azot ammoniac nitrate uh, product were present in Lebanon for such a long time uh, with no uh, uh, kind of uh, um, like uh, um, monitoring uh, or like uh, how to deal with it within the uh, uh, re uh, official military uh, institutions. So uh, within, within this all this background, we can see the kind of work that we're dealing with and definitely uh, of the findings that we had because of the political confessional system that we have in Lebanon, because of the uh, lack of representation of women in the decision-making level, because of uh, uh, the inability for uh, rotation of power in, in, within the Lebanese context, we can see that uh, corruption and uh, inability to have a management for uh, uh, conflict or crisis were prevailing in Lebanon. Uh, second thing, we, we, we saw that there were no documentation of uh, gender segregated uh, data on a survivor of or victims of uh, uh, violence, especially or like connotation of whether this, this kind of violence was a result of uh, weapons or was it a result of any kind of method that there was no mention at all. Uh, we had also like to see what kind of training the NGO related to GBV uh, had to work on. Uh, 
uh, and one of the most important things that uh, the findings of this study will tackle is the missed opportunity that the National Action Plan could have had in the sense that uh, the NAP, though it included the small arms light weapon as one of its strategic uh, uh, priorities, yet it was unable to uh, to have uh, as uh, civil society as uh, implementers or participants of this indicator. And this brings us to our first uh, uh, challenge that we have in terms of the Lebanese system, which is the politicization of the small arms like weapon. It's time for us to humanize it. It's time for us to look at small arms light weapon that kills people, that kills people, whether at home, whether at the street, in, a, in an unlawful way, uh, not in a politicized way, not in the way that politicians have been able to survive the system through uh, maybe giving license to people without taking into account uh, records uh, or criminal records uh, uh, and such. So this is uh, in general, uh, I want to sum up uh, the uh, small arms uh, light uh, weapon uh, survey. Uh, I want to also here uh, to mention, I will put it later on in the chat. Uh, there was a song uh, lately uh, after the new year by a lady. Uh, talking about small arms light weapon and the implications of these small arms weapon, how they are used uh, by cultural and uh, uh, like uh, traditional way of celebrations or in funerals or or even like when a son gets a good grade in school, people will just have uh, these uh, bullets everywhere and many people die out of these uh, stray bullets. Uh, so it's a very, very interesting song uh, that uh, I will share shortly. Now I will come to the second part of uh, my talk, which is uh, the work that we do in uh, G Park. And here I want to, uh, I want to wish uh, uh, also like uh, uh, Najat uh, to to be part of this because we have Sudan also as part of this. Uh, uh, just I want to note that uh, this work with the uh, with Wolf was uh, funded by the Secretariat. Now I'm going to talk about the work that we that we've done within GPAC, within the Women, Peace and Security Coalition, uh, which was uh, funded uh, in 2019 by the Dutch and uh, till 2020 as well, because it was our uh, annual plan. And in 2021, it's funded by CEDA. So uh, uh, our work and uh, the vision that we have within GPAC falls within uh, the issue that the trajectory of conflict in Middle East and North Africa does not respect political or territorial boundaries. As the majority of security challenges, including small arms that weapons circulation are cross-border in nature. So we think that the slightest increase in violence and humanitarian instability exerts pressure on and leads to further insecurity in the entire region. That's why the proliferation of small arms and light weapon is maintained through patriarchal social belief in the militarized defense. So uh, our network of peace builders in MENA uh, have decided to, now I'm going to declare something which, which, which I'm glad to, to to announce it in here in the uh, uh, in this on this panel with this uh, with these marvelous uh, ladies. So first, uh, I'm going to cover three points. Uh, first point that we think of, and we we think that this is how we want to feminize uh, the issue of disarmament, is the transformation towards human security. We need to move away from patriarchal idea that defense and militarization come hand in hand with security. Instead, we need to engage with communities to identify and understand uh, 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 and understand the root causes of conflict and support them in preventing conflict and sustaining peace. We need to establish early warning, early response systems with community monitors in the region who can collect data analyze it and work in multi stakeholders and gender and age inclusive manner to find the solutions. At GPAC, we have been setting the networks capable of gathering and analyzing this data through both of like our uh, youth peace and security coalition and our uh, uh, work that we do within the YPS uh, uh, network, 
where we came up to, to think that a community activist together to inspire local ownership, people-centered approach and inclusive decision-making through a regional coalition that we have named the Small Arms Light Weapon in MENA region uh, with an objective to end uh, a small arms light weapon uh, violations uh, in terms of gender and youth uh, perspective. So this is something that we are doing at a regional level with the, with the uh, 16 countries that we have within MENA Park. Second is the focus on building national capacities to implement its disarmament obligation and stop conflicts from ar arising or prevent their uh, continuation. So this includes uh, promoting disarmament as a critical peace building priority. Second, to support capacities of member states to regulate arms and establish early warning mechanisms. Third, to ensure that security sector reform and DDR programs as components of these processes and not as a post agreement undertaking, just as Sarah was complaining now. In this sense, this armament effort needs to take into consideration not only gendered impact on women, but also needs to generate data about how many women have access and use arms. Third and final point is the shift of focus towards development. Countries in MENA region are lacking behind in their SDG implementation because of the conflict. However, the implementation of the SDGs provides a platform for integrating peace building into national development plans and cooperation frameworks, ensuring that resources are allocated to efforts dedicated to addressing risks and sustaining peace. Building strong societies and institutions, combating corruption, reducing inequality and vulnerabilities are all components critical for advancing peace building, sustaining peace at the national level. So what I'm saying, it's not a revolutionary recommendation based on something that we do not know. However, gaining political will and encouraging accountability for the implementation of international legal and policy frameworks remain a challenge. One small shift that we can do is allowing local peace builders, young women, young men, uh, young people, women, refugees to be part of the dialogue, give them an active role, build their sense of ownership and trust and trust them in be becoming a meaningful and intentional partners, partners at all uh, spheres of society from disarmament to social development to defense. Uh, these are mainly my messages for today. Uh, thank you, back to you, Vanessa. Thank you so much for that, Shireen. I super loved your presentation and I really, really did love the emphasis you made on the importance of civil society, the importance of the people who most of, most of times we are advocating on behalf for. Um, therefore, I would love to now move on to the Q&A session. Um, due to time constraints, um, I would love to just ask one question directed to the whole panel um, and then we, we will end our webinar here. So the question I would love to know is, um, you all in one way or the other talked about the importance of civil society, you talked about the importance of mentorship and the importance of leadership, um, as well as the role that international organizations can play um, in terms of building, um, building these movements and actually um, making it easier um, to actually for, for these movements to thrive. Um, therefore, the question that I would love to ask is, what would be the one advice that um, you could give to inter an international organization that wants to help address and tackle the issues that um, feminist leaders in their organizations or feminist leaders in disarmament are feeling? Um, to whoever would like to, to start and then we just pass the mic on, thank you. Anyone can talk? Yes, please, Sarah. Well, uh, my message that I could uh, leave with everyone is that um, uh, based on my experience, one thing I've known is that ignorance is the biggest weapon. Um, economic is the second. Like currently in South Sudan, um, even though we have an independent country, uh, you would know the number of refugees that has gone to the nearby countries is greater than then when we were fighting as Sudan, you know. 
Uh, and, and the whole issue is that the ignorant label, it is a big problem that needs to be fought because it is about the citizen. If the citizen doesn't know how or his own right, it can be exploited. Second is about the economic. Today, this um, um, proliferation uh, of, um, of, of a slide weapon or even um, the medium weapon is becoming a business. Okay, it become a business, and those who buy it, they go and use it to to intimidate or go and loot others. Like you can hear, there is a lot of reading. Um, if these two can be given a priority, and women are encouraged to really take their place, because one thing. Uh, by the way, let me not say that when I was a soldier, I just went out as 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 a, as a vulnerable. Today, my voice amongst us to the news women, I am proud, and I didn't. I didn't, I didn't uh, develop this resilience out of the blue. From my pain I went through, it, I actually build resilience. I can stand and, and I feel that I own and I have right like any other man. And I think this is also something that should be encouraged among women that they, whether the decision is being made, they should have representative. They don't need to beg. They need to go and say, this is our problem, our space. They have to create their own place. They shouldn't expect others to create for them. What we need from our other sisters, other sisters can hold our hand to help us reach out where we want to reach. For example, give us the knowledge that we needed and give us the, the skill that we need to reach there. And so that we know, well, when I don't, you are there. You are out there that I can call and you can say, okay, where is your hand? I can, I can actually pull you up to here, but you have to climb yourself. Like, like you can hear about uh, bilateral, trilateral. These are guys doing this lateral. Where are the women lateral? When are women going to have this bilateral and trilateral? We need also to, 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 to establish, you know, or create that platform where women, they have to identify and just go, not just by voice, by, by action. This is all I can say. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Sarah. Um, Shreen, would you like to go after? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Sarah, for that. Uh, thank you, Vanessa, for that question. Uh, definitely, I would say first, listen to us. We are not numbers. We don't not die in numbers, we die in names. And we're dying lately so much and everywhere in the world. It's time not only to listen to us, listen to us and act accordingly. I think uh, 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 programs uh, uh, like uh, the Secretary General was calling about the meaningful participation of women to cease fire. So these are all like uh, calls that we need to, to refer to and to make the international community, donors, uh, member states accountable for that. Accountability is major in here. Uh, what we need at the national level, we need to uh, have a knowledge generation, we need uh, uh, women uh, in rural areas, women everywhere to know about their rights, about the international mechanisms uh, that go to disarmament, about their right to live in peace. I mean, like, it's, it's not easy for somebody to, to be living with somebody who has the pistol everywhere at home without taking into, uh, into account, uh, I, I mean, like in the first place, there's no need to have this uh, weapon, but if so, there are certain regulations uh, that we need to follow. For us uh, uh, as uh, grassroots uh, and uh, regional networks, I think uh, uh, long-term flexible funding is very important for us to have holistic and really uh, uh, impactful uh, work we do lots of work we do lots of work uh, sometimes it's it's gone unrecognized we need also to to raise the issue of the role uh, that the peace builders work uh, and to try to support them uh, uh, what is needed is uh, gender uh, aggregated uh, data collections this is a must uh, last, uh, I think uh, the international community has to abide by, even if they are state party or not to the ATT, it's something we need to, to abide by. We need to, to look at the uh, international, uh, at the development of the artificial intelligence, and we need to stop 
uh, any kind of development in terms of the killer robots and to have a treaty, uh, a binding treaty where a human control is there. We need to name and shame the countries that send weapons to states such as uh, Libya or Yemen or Syria or Iraq or Lebanon. Or, or, I mean, like when you're sending weapons, do you expect it like to be a flower? When you're sending weapon to a conflict area where where you have no mechanisms of the rule of law, where you have this conflict, this weapon is going to kill people. Last thing I want also like the grassroots organizations uh, uh, in the countries that uh, uh, that have this uh, weapon industry also to hold their governments accountable we need to to work together i mean it's it's a two ways like they need to help us and they we we need also to give them information to give them information we need to collect data we need to be working we need to work and we need to utilize the social media maybe through uh, scarf maybe through control arms maybe through the killer robots campaign through wealth critical well through gpax networks so we have all these international networks that that have their uh, 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 grassroots activism that we need to support thank you vanessa Thank you so much, Shireen, for, for that answer. Um, unfortunately, Joconda had to leave us due to time constraints. Therefore, um, the last person addressing this question will be Najat Negat. Sorry. Um, تساعدنا في تطبيق الاتفاقية يا سلام إن اتفاقية بل يا سلام السودان وبل أخص في في الترتيبات الأمنية ونحن كنساء دارين جيش واحد الجيش الواحد ويكون برضو في الترتيبات الأمنية النساء كان ناضلا مع ال الكفاح المسلح يكونوا ضمن ال الترتيبات الأمنية يعني لما نجي عمل الدي دي آر وثاني برضو في حاجة بتاعت الاس اس ار النساء المصاحبات دي ما دارين حقهم يعني يروح دارين برضو يعني يلقوا حقوقهم بأي صورة من الصور لكن احنا بهمنا بس تطبيق اتفاق السلام مع تطبيق الغرابة لطاكة 25 بس الضغط في الاتجاه ده يعني احنا هم شيء عندنا um, she is saying that um, there are two more uh, that there are two important things. The first thing is the in international organizations should support in the implementation of the Juba uh, Peace Agreement for Peace in Sudan that was signed last year, and her uh, her uh, movement is actually part of the signatories to the to the Juba Peace Agreement. Uh, so this agreement is very important for her, and she feels that it should be supported by the international organizations and the international community, especially the part on security arrangements, because this is where the peace process uh, materializes on the ground. Another, another thing she was saying is that um, SSR is very important. And so far, women have not been uh, part of um, any conversation on SSR. So women should be integrated on the talk on SSR because there were so many female combatants uh, who fought in the field for so long. And um, the female combatants should be um, integrated into the SSR and into the security arrangement uh, processes. Another thing is uh, Sudan has a national uh, action plan on um, um, resolution 1325. So it should also be um, uh, implemented because it's going to solve a lot of uh, issues related to protection and security for women. And this is a priority and a lot of uh, technical uh, like help is needed to, uh, to, to make sure that it's implemented. Thank you so much for, for, the, for that answer, um, Najat, and thank you so much to all our speakers today. Um, truly appreciate the fact that you found time to be with us despite your busy schedules. So our webinar is now coming to an end. Um, our next webinar in the series is scheduled for the 28th of April, um, and it's going to be on funding, training, and mentoring, opportunities and obstacles for women in disarmament. And that is a topic that we did touch on quite a bit um, in this webinar. Therefore, if you're interested, um, please find more information on our website, on our social media platforms, or um, by using the link in the chat box. Um, thank you so much to all our panelists and to everyone who attended today. Um, we hope that you enjoyed it and had a good time. And please keep uh, um, an eye on our social media outlets for more information. Thank you so much to everyone.
Thank you so much, Vanessa, and thank you, Najat. Uh, sorry is uh, acceptable. Apology acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> Love you all, guys, so and see you Thanks. again Bye. on 28th. And happy 